Speaker here, so I'm oh, going to go to. Have your... I'll just go to little backup speakers, sure. which is a little bit of a kludge, but yeah, I'm afraid the room was occupied just before our time started, so we couldn't really couldn't set test anything. Set up. Sorry. There's actually only one radio right at the beginning, but it's much more fun when you can actually hear it. So, yeah, see if I can make that happen. Call that good enough. All right, you want to say anything? Well, welcome everybody, and thanks very much for coming to today's uh, talk by Professor David Schaefer. I have the pleasure to host David Schaefer until the end of Monday here in Edinburgh. David Schaefer is a professor at the University of Wisconsin Madison in the US. Um, his research and, and work revolves around the areas of uh, games for learning and education and the learning sciences. Uh, David is really well established researcher in the field of uh, learning sciences and quite well known for some of his work on the uh, analysis method which is called epistemic network analysis. Uh, David basically is highly cited for his work in the epistemic networks as well as the uh, games. And he's, in his, his team, he developed many different games and also published several books. But what I really kind of appreciate with, uh, with David when we have a, had a chat is basically some of his work which is related to ethno ethnographic research and the connection between ethnographic research and different types of quantitative methods. And given the very strong background of the group that we have here in digital education, which is building a lot in quantitative, qualitative methods and ethnographic research, I felt well, that the probably best suited talk could be uh, probably something which I'm not quite sure whether it goes together at all. It's quantitative and ethnography in a single phrase. But anyways, let's basically let David to convince us that that makes a lot of okay, sense. Okay, super. Um, so just a couple things. Uh, while we're getting started. So first of all, now that I've proved I own a jacket, would anybody mind if I just took it off because it's a little warm in here? So, okay, all right. Um, so I've, I, I've proved that I've dressed appropriately enough. All right, so the second thing is, I'm not usually big on audience participation in talks, but I want to take a quick poll. And this is not an exclusive poll. You can answer yes to more than one question. Okay, so how many people in the room here uh, feel like they use uh, qualitative methods in their research of some kind? Okay. Yeah, you're allowed to do this too. Um, and how many people feel like they use quantitative methods in their research? Okay, excellent. Just trying to get a sense of, of who's interested in what. Um, so as, uh, as Dragon said, uh, my interest uh, from a number of different perspectives is on, um, okay, there we go, on complex collaborative problem solving. So how people learn to solve uh, complex problems, real world problems, and how they learn to work together in groups to do that, and how they learn to um, uh, learn about working together in groups. Um, I can certainly say more about that. I'll say a little bit more about that as the, in the talk, and I can certainly talk more about that part of my work. 
um, uh, at the end when, if people have questions. Um, what I want to focus on here is some of the methods that we use. So, uh, uh, I'm sorry, so the analytic methods that we use to understand this kind of phenomenon in the context of the work that we do. Uh, so, the approach that uh, we take in my lab to uh, helping students develop complex collaborative problem solving skills and to measuring their complex uh, collaborative problem solving skills uh, is to use games. Uh, we think of them more as professional simulations and games, but they're role-playing games. I'm going to just show a quick video. That's where all the fuss was here. So hopefully you'll be able to hear it. Um, that just describes one of these games. And mostly this is just to give you some grounded context for the kind of data that I'll talk about a little bit later in the talk. Um, so let me just show the video. It's a little bit kind of promotional. It's made by my students who are trying to kind of sell their work. So just ignore that part. <laughs> it's mostly just to get a sense of what, this, what the situation that students are in looks like. Nephrotex is a computer game in which students play the role of interns at Nephrotex, an engineering company that manufactures membranes for dialysis machines. The work begins when players get an email from Alex, the design team leader, a fictional character in the virtual internship who requires them to design a filtration membrane prototype. To get started on the design process, we conduct some research on one specific material used for filtration membranes and the specifications that internal consultants within the company care about. Players use FEEDS, the Form for Electronic Experimental Device Simulation, a tool which allows them to create and input experimental devices that get sent to a testing lab. Interns cycle through the engineering process by designing, building, and testing devices. Players team up to determine what the internal consultants of the company find acceptable. Then they regroup to develop a final prototype. When designing our prototype, we had to try and meet the internal consultants' thresholds and also determine in our teams which attributes were the most important and justify all our design decisions in our engineering notebook. After agreeing on a final prototype, Players prepare a presentation that justifies their design choices. It definitely helped me understand the process that like, an engineer goes through developing new technologies. Along the way, players can communicate with live design advisors using a built-in chat tool. Design advisors model how professional engineers work, help the players when they get stuck, and push players to reflect on their work. Nephrotex has been played by students from ages 16 to 18, both in high school classes and freshman engineering introduction classes in universities. It kind of gave me a little more push to learn with engineering because I know that it can be difficult, but by kind of seeing, you know, what I can get to and what I can be doing, I, it just makes me want to do that. Okay, so thank you for putting up with the poor quality audio. Um, so this is the, this is the con kind of context in which I work and when, in the context for which the methods that I'm going to talk about were developed. They were developed for this context, although they can be used in other contexts as well. Um, so here, in a sense, is the uh, conceptual challenge that we face. Right? In the kind of work that I do, and I imagine that many of you do, um, there, we have... Uh, in my case, a game, and we want to know how, how well it works. And the typical way that we do that is we do something else, like we get a pretest is one weird thing, but we have students do something, then they do the game that we've designed or the intervention or whatever it is that uh, we've, we, we've created, and then you do something else again. Right. Now, for our purposes, let's not worry about the fact that we design games. There's some kind of events, there's something happened, there's something that we design, there's something that students do. And the way that we evaluate that typically is by looking at the thing at the beginning and the thing at the end and seeing whether there was a change. And essentially, we wind up really ignoring the events themselves in a lot of education research. Not all education research, but in a lot of it, right? We're going to test whether this works by seeing whether somebody does something at the beginning and then whether they change what they can do at the end. For many of us in the room, certainly for me, I'm actually interested in the events themselves. I want to know how different parts of the events actually contributed to the change that we see. Where, where, how is learning taking place? And I want to know how the events internally are related to one another. So how does one thing that happens, in my case during the game, but during whatever the activity is, how does that relate to the other things that are happening? 
So in order to answer that question, we need a different set of methods than kind of the typical pre-post assessments that are used in educational research. In order to do that, we have to have a framework for thinking about how learning works or what learning is about that lets us do this kind of analysis. So at the core, my framework for thinking about learning is that learning is about enculturation and that games and other environments and interventions work because they help people learn to adopt some culture. Let me give you a quick sense of what I mean by a game creating a culture. This is actually not an edu- well, every game is educational because everything we do is educational, right? It always changes us in some way. But, so here's a compu- uh, computer game that used to be one of my kids' favorite games to play. Um, it's called Webkins. My guess is many of you are not familiar with it unless you have small children and live in the United States. Oh, somebody is familiar with it, obviously. No. Um, so in Webkins, you buy a plush toy, a stuffed animal, right? Because, uh, of course, it's the U.S., so you have to buy something. To and then the stuffed animal appears in this virtual world, and you can interact with this stuffed animal in the virtual world. So you can ask your pet questions, and then your pet can give you kind of pro-social answers that teach you about the way that you should act in the world. Um, the main mechanic of the game, again, this being a U.S. game, is you buy stuff for your pet. So it's about shopping. It teaches you how to use like the, the checkout at Amazon.com and so forth. Right? Um, <clears throat> so in order to buy stuff for your pet, you obviously have to get money. So there's a few different ways that you can get money. It's called Kins Cash or, uh, in the game. So you can, uh, you can gamble. Uh, that's one way to get money. Um, another thing you can do is you can complete uh, educational activities. This one's called Booger Gets an A. Uh, essentially what you're doing is figuring out how to make smaller numbers add up to a larger number. It's an addition, uh, for little kids, an addition game. Um, and then you get kind of the typical pro-social messages about mathematics. Um, you can, I kid you not, go to work in the mines. You can, you can become a miner. Um, and uh, also you can do a, a whole host of other 21st century things like uh, delivering newspapers, painting fences, being somebody's personal assistant. Right? So this is the sense in which uh, a, a game like this is about enculturation. It's teaching you about the way the world is supposed to work. Um, sadly, the way the world works in many places, not exactly what I think that uh, kids should learn, but nevertheless. Uh, so in order to unpack this idea of learning being about occult- enculturation, I'm going to borrow a concept from Jim G, who some of you are probably familiar with, those of you who, who work in quanti- and qualitative work, uh, who writes about something called a discourse, what he calls a big D discourse. And a big D discourse is a socially accepted association among ways of using language of thinking, feeling, believing, valuing, acting that can be used to identify oneself as a member of a community or signal that one is playing a role. In other words, the big D discourse you can think of as the constituents of a culture. It's the stuff that makes one enculturated. Um, I just came from spending a couple of days in in France uh, working with another researcher, right? And I can tell that I'm that I am not enculturated in France by the fact that I don't speak the language. I don't always know what to do when I uh, go into a store and what the proper way to greet people is. I don't know what the rules about tipping are. Right? So those are all signs that I don't understand a culture. When I understand a culture, I know how to behave properly, properly within it. Um, put, put another way, uh, the thing that we're interested in, be, in somebody being able to do is participate in a culture of complex problem solving, to think the way an architect or a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer, the people who actually do stuff in the world. We want kids to be prepared for that. In order to do that, we have to develop a discourse. We have to teach them sort of the, the rules of the road within that culture. Um, and to do that, uh, they have to understand the, con- the component elements of a culture. So let me give you a quick example of sort of the difference between uh, uh, how one looks at, a cu- at something differently depending on your culture. So uh, let's imagine for a moment that outside was a, a patch of dirt. Right? When I see a patch of dirt, what I think of is the fact that if I walk through the patch of dirt, my shoes are going to get dirty. Okay. On the other hand, is Charles Goodwin, who some of you are probably familiar with, uh, uh, who studied uh, anthropology. Uh, studied, he was somebody who studied anthropologists, I guess is a better way to put it. Right? Um, he points out that what an anthropologist looks, looks for, what an archaeologist looks for, is signs of the past as reflected in the dirt itself. So, for example, an archaeologist or an anthropologist looks at the different consistency of the dirt to see where 
there might have been a post once in the past, or a wall, or a building, or some other structure that's reflected in the, in the ground itself. Uh, the way that an uh, uh, archaeologist does this um, is by using something called um, a Munsell color chart. So they actually have a chart where they can compare the different kinds of soil and understand what its color and striation are in order to, to try and reconstruct what had happened in the past in that soil. In other words, there's a relationship between the soil, for an archaeologist, and the Munsell color chart, and the post hole, the thing that used to exist there. Um, Goodwin refers to these things as codes. In, uh, so a culture is composed of different codes, things that somebody recognizes as being meaningful. For me, the, the, the code of the dirt is that it is something that gets on my shoes. For an archaeologist, there's the soil, there's the post hole, and there's the Munsell color chart, and these are all things that are meaningful within that discourse. The thing that I would add to, to Goodwin's explanation of these codes is that they're actually connected to one another. So the Munsell color chart actually is meaningful because you use it to examine soil. It's also meaningful because you use it to uncover the fact that there might be a post hole somewhere. In other words, these codes are connected to one, each, one, one another in a systematic relationship. Or if we go back to our, uh, so, in, sorry, so in my work, I've called this, um, this assemblage of codes an epistemic frame. And it's a useful way of thinking about it because you can think about this as like a pair of glasses. When I become enculturated, I put on a certain worldview, and that worldview colors what I see. It makes me look at things the way an archaeologist or an architect or an engineer or a parent or a, t a professor or a teacher, the way that somebody looks at those things. And these epistemic frames are assemblages of codes, the codes from the discourse, that are systematically connected to one another. Um, so to put that in terms of our original diagram, right? Uh, culture can be described in terms of a discourse, which can be described in terms of the codes that are present in the discourse. But it's not just one code, it's a collection of codes. And it's not just a collection of codes as in, as in a bunch of stuff, it's a collection of codes that are systematically related to one another. Okay, Whew. all right, so that's, some, that's sort of some background machinery. Um, <clears throat> let me, uh, let me make sense of that for a moment um, by giving you kind of an example of how it is that one would enact this in the context of the data that I work with, so in the context of one of the games that we've developed. So the game I'm going to draw some data from is called Rescue Shell. You saw a video of a game that's similar to it in the video. The students were designing a kidney dialysis membrane. In Rescue Shell, they're designing um, a robotic exoskeleton, so like a uh, robotic legs that somebody could use to be able to lift heavy objects and rescue people from buildings, something like that. Um, so these are virtual internships, as you saw in the video, which means that the students are working together, and as part of that, they're talking with one another. So we have records of, the, of their talk. And their talk looks something like this. So here's one student saying, I'm wondering, did anybody have a prototype that was able to meet the internal consultant's recharge interval, or that is something we might not be able to accomplish? Is that something we might not be able to accomplish and focus on more important characteristics to the workers, such as payload and agility? That's, so that sounds very engineering-y, right? <laughs> it's like they're doing good work, the kind of thing if a high school student were saying to another high school student, you'd go, oh, good, okay, that sounds like a good, good thing. Um, so we can see within this a couple of different codes that are important within the discourse of engineering. So, for example, they're talking about performance metrics, the recharge interval and payload and agility, right? And they're talking about design trade-offs. So, something we might not be able to accomplish and focus on more important characteristics to the workers. Um, in other words, what's happening here is we want to understand culture by looking at discourse and seeing the connection of the codes in the discourse. What we have is actual discourse, and Jim G makes the distinction between the big D discourse, which is the way in which somebody thinks in the world, and the small D discourse, which is the actual stuff that people say and do. And here I'm just going to take uh, saying as a form of doing, because of course if I say something, I'm doing something, and doing as a form of saying, because anytime I do something, I express something that somebody else can see. So uh, these are all utterances, these are actions that are, that are meaningful in a cultural sense. Okay, so I have discourse. Well, I don't actually have the discourse. The discourse is what the people actually did. What I have is some record of that discourse. I have the data that I've collected, um, oops, sorry, I went backwards, um, which I'm just going to generically refer to as field notes. In this case, it's actually a log file. It's a record from the computer of what the students said. But conceptually, it's the same idea. I have some record that I took 
of what happened in the world. That's the field notes. And the challenge is, how do I go from the field notes, I have this stuff that I collected, to the stuff over here. Right? And I can't just, oops. Um, oh, sorry, I'll get to the challenge in a second. So here's what the field notes look like in this case. This is the record of what happened. These are well-organized field notes because the computer took them, but it's the same idea. And this, these field notes are broken up into lines. So these lines here are actually turns of talk. Uh, we also have data about the things that the, the, the students clicked on in the interface, the documents they opened, and those are all recorded as well. I'm not going to talk about that in the analysis here. In the, in your, in the, when we get to questions, I can certainly talk about how that aligns, but it's, it's a pretty direct, pretty direct mapping. Um, I should point out that these lines are not un completely unstructured. Right? There are certain, in this case, is activities that students are engaged in, so they work on one thing one day and one thing the next day. Uh, the technical term for this within discourse analysis, or one technical term, um, is stanzas. So the lines are, are grouped into sections that are associated with one another, so that what happened here right, doesn't actually have that much to do with what happened here, because those are on two different days. So the things that are within the same stanza are related to one another. The challenge is, how do we go from this to understanding culture? Well, we can't just read the field notes and directly understand the culture. Well, if we're enculturated, we can, and if we know how to read field notes. Um, but that's a difficult task. Right? Nor can we go directly from field notes to the discourse, because, again, unless we're enculturated, we don't actually know how to make this translation. Um, and in fact, in many cases, we can't go directly from the field notes to the, uh, the encoding. That's the coding process, as you know. What we need to do instead is develop something that uh, Andrew Pickering calls a machinic grip. I actually prefer the term mechanical grip because machinic isn't actually an English word, but you can choose whichever one you like. The idea of a, of a machinic grip is it's a way of grabbing a hold of the complex phenomena in the world. So codes, meaning, things that people do, those are very difficult to describe in precise terms in the same way that it's difficult to describe in precise terms where an electron is. A machinic grip is the, essentially the apparatus of science that lets us kind of make an attachment between our theories and our methods and our models and the thing in the world that's always a little bit uh, complex and fuzzy. In this case, our mechanical grip is recognizing that the codes are culturally relevant and meaningful aspects of a discourse. Right? Those are the things that when we are thinking as ethnographers, we look at our data and we code it. We identify instances of things that we think are important. Everybody who's in a, who does qualitative work should probably nod at this point, right? Because you, you do some kind of coding. Um, in order to enact that coding, we actually use what I'm call, gonna call small c codes, which are things that count as evidence or warrants for the big c codes. And again, this is something we're all familiar with, right? We develop what we would call a code book. Right, which says, here's the phenomena that I'm interested in, here's what I mean by that phenomena, and here's how I identify it in my data. Right, and that code book is the way that we take these field notes, the record of this very messy and complicated thing that happens in the world, and we translate it into the codes that we can then use analytically um, to make sense of, the, um, of the, this complex phenomena. Diagrammatically, it goes something like this. Right? We start with the discourse, we record the field notes, we develop a code book, and that code book is essentially the translation between the stuff that's happening in the world and whatever model it is that we're creating about the world. And I just want to be clear in saying model that I don't necessarily mean that this is an edict enterprise. Right? This is not me imposing something from the outside. The codes that, I've de that I'm developing can be grounded, they can be emic, they can be from the point of view of the participants. But I still have to do some kind of identification, some kind of pointing at the data in order to make sense of it. Right? Somewhere, no matter how grounded it is that I, what, what, I, what I'm doing, if I'm gonna present a story about what happened in the world, somebody can say, wait, how do you know? And I'm gonna point at something in the data. I'm gonna say, well, look, right here, this person did this, and this person did this, and here's how I'm gonna construct my story. And that pointing, that pointing is this mechanical grip between the two. Now, ideally, in an ethnographic sense, what we're going to do is use this process of going from discourse to field notes to codes to the meaningful things in the, within the discourse to understanding the organization of the discourse to the culture to create what Clifford Geertz and many other people subsequently have called, the, it's actually Gilbert Ryle who started, but um, called thick description. Right? And the idea of a thick description is that it's an explanation of what's happening in the culture um, <clears throat> that's grounded in the, understand, the meanings that people make themselves. 
Um, one question about thick description, of course, is um, once we've constructed it, right, have we constructed a, a description that is sufficiently thick? Does it really capture what we're supposed to capture? Is it, in fact, just some isolated instance? Not that there's anything wrong with some isolated instance, but we want to know, is this some isolated instance, or am I telling a story that resonates with the culture more broadly? Um, and that, that distinction is sometimes described as being a question of theoretical saturation. Right? Have I looked at enough data? Have, is, is my does my story encompass enough information um, in order to be something that uh, is essentially uh, a recurrent pattern within this culture? Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with the term, theoretical saturation just literally means that I, I reach a point where continuing to examine additional data doesn't show me anything different than I've, than I've already seen. Um, so that's kind of a, the, a, a basic process by which ethnographic work and qualitative work more generally proceeds. What I'd like to do now is zoom in on a couple of pieces of this basic mechanism and look at the ways in which quantitative methods can be used to support this basic process. So the first one I'd like to start with is this idea of creating a code book or in particular, going from the small C code, the things that I see in the data, to the big C code, the things that have meaning. Um, sorry, I'm just going to take a sip here. So in a sort of very broad and generic way, data looks something like this. I have a series of things that happened in the world. My data when I take ethnographic notes by, by hand is a lot messier than this. I don't even know if anybody still does notes by hand. They just probably type on an iPad, most of my students. But in any case, I get a series of, of statements about the world. These happen to be uh, terms of talk as students are chatting. But the point is that, that there's always some organization where there are a series of events that I've recorded in some way. Um, the idea of codes is that I attach to this the categories of meaning. So each of these columns is a big C code. It's something that's meaningful in the world. And I've attached here either a 1 or a 0. And the 1 or the 0 indicates that the small c code, small c code was present here, which warrants my saying that there's a, the big C code is present in the data at that point. Here's the thing, though. So let's, let's pick a code like design trade-offs. OK, so here's the codes for a series of data. I've thrown away all the data part. We're just looking at the codes now. right? <coughs> And there's a couple different ways that people do this. You could do this by hand. So you could go through the data and you have a code book and you could say, oh, here in the data is an example of this big C code of design trade-offs. Um, uh, you can do it by, if you're clever and if your data is structured in a particular way and if your um, uh, codes are of a particular kind, you can also get a computer to do that. That's very handy because if you have a lot of data, the computer can do it, well, quicker. Um, but the question is, if the computer does it and if a person does it, are those really going to be the same thing, right? We want to understand something about the reliability, the consistency of the codes that we do. So if I just sit down and code something by hand, that doesn't mean that anybody else will agree with my codes. If the computer does it, it can do it very quickly, but it might produce nonsense. The way that we typically resolve that is using a, um, a process of uh, interweighted reliability. And the challenge, of course, is that in a short data set, I can just code everything, and then you can code everything, and we can compare. But if I have a very long data set, if the data keeps going and going and going and going and going, eventually even the most robust graduate student gets tired, right? And, <laughs> and I see one robust graduate student going, yeah. Um, right? And you have to use some other method to, to take a shortcut. So the typical way that we do this right, is that we establish some statistic, that's the S, some measure that we're going to have of how closely, close in agreement these two things are. This is called interrated reliability, right? Um, and there's a number of statistics that people use for that. We're going to measure some statistic, and if that statistic is over some threshold, if the level of agreement, the reliability of our coding is high enough, we're going to say we're in agreement. The code, in fact, makes sense. I agree, you agree, we think the same thing, or the computer agrees, and you agree, and I agree, and now our code is good, it's reliable. The small c code that we use to identify things in the data matches the big c code. It means what we think it means, and now we can proceed. Um, the statistic that a lot of people use is Cohen's kappa. Some of you are probably familiar with it if you ever use inter-rater reliability. It's essentially rate of agreement adjusted for chance. There are a ton of other statistics, that each of which has slightly different mathematical properties and uh, 
all of which have a fundamental flaw, which I'm about to tell you about. But um, uh, there are reasons to choose one or another. And again, we can talk more about that in the discussion if you'd like. Uh, there's a, uh, this is sort of a pretty reasonably acceptable threshold, accept, well accepted threshold for kappa. That's, by the way, people, the reason people use kappa is there's sort of a reasonably well accepted threshold. Some people use 0.6, some people use 0.7 if they want to be conservative. 0.65 is a, a sort of compromise between being not so conservative and being conservative. Um, and so the question in the data is, is kappa above, is the level of agreement above this threshold? Now typically what we do is we take a test set. So again, anybody who does this sort of work is familiar with it. You take some subset of the data and you get two people or a person in a machine or whatever you're comparing to code the test set, right? And you determine the kappa of the test set. So in this case, I've, this is obviously a silly example, but I took a small test set and the kappa is 0.78. And typically what we say is, oh, 0.78 is higher than 0.65, so our kappa is good. Right? And this, is, this, by the way, is what I, what I refer to as the common method for doing inter-rater reliability. So you take this test set, you measure the kappa. If kappa is above your threshold, you conclude that your coding is good. And to warrant the fact that this is, called the, 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 this is a common method, um, <coughs> We look through all of the issues of the Journal of Learning Sciences and the International Journal of Computer Supported Collaborative Learning, which just happened to be two journals in my field. We've looked at a couple of others as well. We found 44 articles that used kappa. They computed 141 kappa values as, as <coughs> to warrant their codes. And the number of times that kappa was subjected to a statistical test was zero. Now, what do we mean by kappa was suggest, subjected to a statistical test? Well, think about this for a minute. Let's say that I was curious as to what the, whether the average height of people, of students at the University of Edinburgh was over six foot, six foot. So what I did was I took the students in this room and I measured their height and I found that their average height was five foot nine. And then I concluded, well, in, the, in these students, their height is less than five foot nine, it is less than six foot. So everybody at the University of Edinburgh must be less than six feet tall. Well, all the students, the average must be less than six feet. Well, that would be silly. Right? The whole purpose of statistics is to figure out whether or not the sample that I have justifies the broader conclusion. And the point is that nobody does that with inter-rater reliability. So we decided to test whether or not that was really causing a problem. So we looked at a bunch of different frequencies with which a code occurs, right? So a frequency, if a code occurs with a frequency of 0.01, it means that one in a hundred things that are in the data set that code is present. A frequency of 0.5 would be that half the time in the data that code is present. That's sort of absurd in an ethno, for an ethnographic code, but we were testing it anyway. So this gives a range. And this is actually the real range that we see in our data is, is almost always less than 0.2, and it's usually somewhere between 0.1 and 0.01. So that's sort of the frequency with which things that you're going to code, that we code in the data that we see, kind of in ethnographic terms, that's, that's how often it appears. And then we said, well, what are the kinds of test sets that people re reliably use in the world? So we took about 20 is, more, is shorter than probably most people use. And 800 is probably longer than anybody ever wants to use. But so this would be the test set itself. Because of course, in the common method, you often do a test set, you test, you go, oh, we didn't, we weren't in agreement. You talk and you resolve the differences and then you do it again, right? But so this is the actual test set lengths. And so what we did was a, what's called a Monte Carlo simulation, where we generated a ton of test sets, uh, sorry, a ton of, of data sets, 10,000 data sets that were 10,000 long, where there were two, two coders had coded them within reasonable, the reasonable ranges of, the, of uh, agreement that you might see. Then from each one, we selected a test set. We computed the kappa of the test set. We computed the kappa of the real data, because now we knew what the real kappa was, and we saw how many times this common method said, yep, the coding's good, and in fact it wasn't. So that's the type one error rate that we were computing. Here's what it looked like. Yeah, it's really bad, right? So essentially, unless you have really, really frequent codes, like unless you're talking about something that occurs a third of the time in your data, which, you know, if you're talking about kids learning in a classroom, that does not, nothing happens a third of the time. I mean, except maybe kids talking out, you know, talking out of turn. Um, so I don't think that would happen a third of the time. Otherwise, the stuff that's really important doesn't happen like that. And you'd have to code 800, two people would have to code 800, whatever it was you were coding, whatever it was you were coding for, 800 of them, in order to get a reason, in order to get a reasonable type one error rate. So basically, all the integrated reliability that you have seen in any article ever is wrong. 
That's the that's the take home from this. I, I'm, it's it's quite shocking. We have, we've actually checked the mathematics many times over. And it turns out, and this is again an issue for questions, there are methods that people use to do a significance test for kappa. Those are also all incorrect. They don't do it's when people do it, they do it wrong. They test kappa against zero. So they show that it's that the agreement is not at random, but not that it's over the threshold. So this is a big problem. Um, right, so here I'm just illustrating like this is two, a test set of two hundred is a little large, but that's sort of what reasonably what people do and with a kappa of, uh, sorry, with a frequency of 0.1, you're going to almost certainly be wrong 10% of the time. You have to get all the way up here before you're likely to get right. So, what can we do about that? Well, it turns out there is a solution, although it's taken us a couple of years to develop. I mean, I'm going to sort of describe it briefly for you, and then the bottom line is that there's, an, there's a statistical tool you can use to do this. But um, So, what we're talking about in this case is, a frequency with which the code occurs, and a total length of the test set. So let's imagine we just created a pretend data set that had that that had this frequency, right? And had it was so we randomly chose kind of what its level of agreement was and all the other properties of the data set. We're just going to choose it at random, but it has a frequency that, uh, that we know. And what we're going to do is construct this so that we know that its kappa is less than our threshold. We're going to deliberately construct a bad data set. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. But we're not just going to construct one of them. We're going to construct a whole bunch of them. So now I have, we literally do it with like a thousand, two thousand, I think it's two, um, bad data sets. These are all bad coding sets. Then from each one, we're going to take a sample. And we're going to take a sample of just the kind that you did when you were doing your coding. So um, what's your name? Nick. Nick. So Nick and John right, are doing uh, automated, uh, they're doing uh, 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 integrated reliability. They code 200, they code a test set of 200, and now they want to know whether that test set, is, and they get a kappa, and they want to know whether their kappa is good enough. So they coded it at 200, and we know that the base rate of the code in their set was about 0.2. We create all these bad sets, we take samples of the same size as theirs, and for each sample, we compute its kappa. So we take all these test sets, and we compute the kappa of all of these test sets that we know came from bad sets. And we get a distribution of the kappa of the test sets among sets that are no good. Then we look and see, well, sets that are no good, right? Then we look and see, so this is essentially the distribution of kappa under the null hypothesis. This is the what kappa would look like if in fact they were not in agreement. So if they in fact didn't agree, this is what the dis this is what kappas we might likely see. Then we look at the kappa that they got, right? And from the kappa that they got, we can determine what percentage of the time, if in fact they were not agree in agreement, they would see that kappa. In other words, this gives us an estimate. This is called rho, an estimate of the type one error rate for generalizing from what they did to whether or not they're really in agreement. Now, I'm sure some of you are thinking. Oh, it's hard enough to get kappa to begin with, to get a good kappa to begin with. You're kidding me. I now have to do a statistical test that might tell me that even though it looks like I'm in agreement, I'm wrong. But here's the thing. Statistics, statistical tests are designed to tell you not how much data you need, but how little data you need. Right? What Rho tells you when you've coded enough. So it may be that they don't even have to code 200 to get agreement. If you can use a statistical test, they could, maybe they code 40 excerpts, right? Nick and John only have to code a little bit, and the statistics can tell them whether or not they've coded enough. So we've taken this row and turned it into an R package. Those of you who use R for statistics, um, it's called ROAR, row R, um, and you can download it and use it. And essentially, you just take the codes that you did, so two people's codes, ones and zeros, and you give it to row. And it will tell you whether or not your, the kappa that you have is statistically significant. But since many people, uh, uh, so but we've done one better, okay? And I'll, I'll explain why, and uh, I'll show you what we did, and then I'll explain why it's one better. So we've developed a tool called Encoder, and the idea of Encoder is that it not only 
uses row, but it uses some other tricks to help you develop and validate automated codes. So that now instead of uh, Nick and John having to do this together, Nick can create a computer algorithm that does it and then can give it to John to test. But Nick can get agreement with the computer. And the way this works is uh, you upload your data. And again, I'm not, I'm not really giving a demo here. I'm, I'm happy to show individuals afterwards, and I'll give you a website in a bit. Uh, you define a code or codes and give it a definition. <clears throat> and then you give it some key words or word patterns, things that you essentially give it some of the small C codes that you think might be indicative of the code. So things like sacrifice or um, but, but after decrease or but, but after increase. And so this is for trade-offs, right? So these are the kinds of things that somebody might say in an engineering context that would indicate they're making trade-offs about their design. Then the system picks some of the uh, excerpts from the data and gives them to you and just says, okay, here's the code, here's the description. Is this an example of the code, yes or no? It lets you code them by hand. And then once, you've done co once you're done coding a bunch of them, it lets you run a test. So I can test whether or not what the rate of agreement is between what I did and what the computer did based on these key words and patterns that I gave it. And critically, it's going to tell me what my kappa is. So if my kappa is 0.67, I'm over the threshold. But it will also tell me what my row is, which is 0.45, which means my likely type 1 error rate is 45%. So this is not, I, that wasn't enough. Um, <coughs> Now, there's a few other things that the tool will let me do. If I've actually finished getting agreement with the computer, I can invite a second reader. So if I'm, if I'm John doing the coding, when I'm done, I can now, I'm sorry, when I'm Nick, I can now invite John so that now I'm sure that not only, so Nick is sure that not only does he and the computer agree, but he and the computer and John all agree. So now you have two people saying, yes, this means the same thing, and the computer saying, yes, this means the same thing. And now you have a, a reasonable warrant that the code means what you think it does, and the computer is great because even better than a graduate student, it never gets tired of coding things. Um, if, if in fact, I'm not in, we're not yet in agreement, I can go and resolve the differences. So the machine will essentially show me the places where our codes disagreed. And then I can, um, <coughs> so that's the place where our codes disagree. Then I could add or subtract keywords, or I can add new word patterns if there's something more complicated. And this lets me kind of design a word pattern. Um, or I can just decide that I was wrong. And f the funny thing is, it turns out when you do this, uh, for me anyway, about half the time, I'll, c I'll say, no, that's not an example of a trade-off. And based on my you know, word list, the, the computer will say, yeah, they were making a trade-off. I'll read it and I'll go, oh yeah, I guess they were. I kinda, like, the computer was essentially reading more carefully than I was, right? Because I'm coding quickly. And so, so this actually happens a fair amount of, uh, fair amount of the time. Um, Critically, what the system does is it gives me what's called a training kappa. So think about it this way. I see one, there's one thing where the computer and I have disagreed. And I say, oh, this keyword, if I add this keyword, that will capture this code and then the computer will get it right. But it may be that I add a keyword, but in, in the rest of the data messes everything up. Right, so it's a very, it's kind of an isolated, it's in an isolated case. So when I make a change, the training kappa, either the computer recalculates kappa as if I had added this new word or phrase to the set and tells me whether overall my agreement goes up or down. That way I sort of know when I'm adding a new word whether I'm messing things up. Um, okay, so that's a sort of brief overview of Encoder. And again, anybody who really wanted to use it, we have a, we have a couple of graduate students who are, whose job on the grant that developed Encoder is to help people learn to use it. So if, you, if you're interested, we can certainly show you. If you're not interested, that's fine too, um, but please use Rho, because <laughs> otherwise your coding isn't, isn't gonna work. Um, now there's a bunch of work out there. I know some people in the room here do work on topic modeling or natural language processing or latent semantic analysis of data. And mostly what that's trying to do is figure out a way to go from field notes and induce to sort of figure out what the patterns and the codes and the things that are, the words that are related to what other, one another in the data might be. That's fine. Encoder is designed to do something slightly different, which is to go like this, right? Encoder is trying to help you figure out what the appropriate small c <coughs> codes are and then help you warrant that the, your small c codes in fact are reflective of your big c codes. That, so that's rho greater than alpha, that's the statistical test. In a sense, what Encoder is doing is providing a warrant for theoretical saturation. 
it said, I've done enough coding by hand in this data set that I now know that the rest of the, that the codes are valid and that the computer or another person can go off and code them and that in fact this, this is going to be a, a, val a valid code. So the warrant here is that in fact I've done enough. That's what theoretical saturation says. If I, I could continue to test my codes, John and Nick could continue to test their codes, but they don't need to. They've done enough to get theoretical saturation. Um, okay, so this is one piece of quantitative ethnography. There's a second piece that we need to talk about, which is over here. That is the relationships between the codes. So again, let me step into the, back into the data that I'm familiar with to give you a quick example, and then we'll work through some of the math of that. So uh, we talked already about the game rescue shell. Students are designing, they're working as engineers, and when you work as an engineer, right, one of the things you get is a set of performance requirements. Here's the stuff that the, the thing you're designing has to do. Here's what matters about it. Um, but usually, the reason that engineers get paid what they do is that you can't just make a machine that does everything that it's supposed to do. I mean, sometimes you can, but usually you can't. You have to engage in a series of design trade-offs. Um, and that what you want to do, ideally, right, is connect design performance requirements and design trade-offs. But you can't directly connect those things, or you can't do it easily. What you need to do instead is develop a set of performance metrics, ways of measuring those requirements, and then those measurements are what let you make the trade-offs. So I can't just say it needs to be strong and fast. I have to be able to quantify what strong and fast mean, and then I can start to trade off against them in my design. Okay? Um, so what I want to focus on is just one of these connect oops, yeah, one of these connections. So let's just look at this connection between performance metrics and design trade-offs. Uh, so here's a, um, the piece of data that we looked at before, right? Here's the performance metrics. Here's the design trade-offs. In this piece of dialogue, well, I guess it's, yeah, it's a piece of dialogue. It's actually a unilog right here, but it's in part, it's part of a dialogue. Um, <coughs> we see somebody making the connection between these two things. But of course, connections, when you're working in a group, don't always happen within one thing that I say. Connections can also happen between people. So one person might be looking at justifying the design in terms of what their consultants care about. And another person might have said earlier that we have to think about the design criteria. And because those are in temporal proximity, they're related to one another. Right? Over some span of time, there's a recent temporal context. And within a discussion, right, the thing that somebody said before is, being, is referred to by something that gets said later. If we kind of take this, so what we get is like this little window, this little stanza, this little collection of lines that are related to one another. And we can think of this as like a little window that slides through the data. And as it slides through the data, we identify different connections that are made between what I say, or among what I say, and what the people have said before me. So we can think of each little line of data as being represented by this little window. In other words, each little line of data is actually a network that connects these different ideas. It's the codes that are in the line of data and that are in the previous lines that it's related to. So now imagine I just went through the data and I, for one particular person, and I started kind of accumulating, assembling all the different connections that they had made. So at one point in time, for instance, the blue person, we'll just call him that, um, the blue person made this connection. We just saw that in the data. Right? And then the next turn, they might make this set of connections, or a, a couple of turns later. Now if I add those together, the cumulative network looks like this. And if I keep kind of letting the simulation go, if I let the, the game run, if I let the students work over time, some of those lines are going to get thicker. They'll be reinforced. The connections that they'll be made over and over again. There'll be new ones that get added. And so over some period of time, I can look at what the cumulative network of codes and the connections between them looks like for one individual. Now for a different, so this might be, let's say, uh, Nick's network. John's network might look really different. John might have been focusing on different things. And now I can use these networks to compare the way that John was talking and the way that Nick was talking. And in this case, I can kind of get a sense of the differences, although even just putting two up like this, it's a little hard to read. One of the things I could do, though, is instead of characterizing these networks just by pictures, I could characterize the networks by um, their centroids. And for those of you who are not familiar with the term centroid, it's just the center of mass. So imagine this blue thing was an actual object, a physical object, and I kind of hung it from a string. The center of mass is the place where it balances. It's like the center where all the connections are. So if this is 
Nick's center of mass, right? John's center of mass would be over here. And the reason that this is useful is it gives me a way of quickly getting a sense of whether, like John, right, was, had, was making these connections between performance requirements and collaboration and data. John is all about collaboration. He's the guy who wants to make sure everybody's working together. Right? Is, that, is that true, John? Um, and Nick right, was over on this side. And Nick was all about performance metrics and design trade-offs. And now it becomes really easy to compare these two networks quickly. Um, what this lets us do is think about a space in which these two students um, are working where the points are a dimensional reduction of their co-occurrence matrices. I just said that very quickly for those of you who are mathy. But essentially what we're doing is taking these matrices, the, these co-occurrence networks, which are really just matrices, we're projecting them into a high dimensional space, and then we're rotating them down to get a sort of cross-sectional view. Again, I can say more about that in the questions, but I just, people always ask, so somebody always asks, so I just put this in here to explain. And then the nodes are located by doing an optimization that creates a correspondence between the network and the centroids and these points. Again, I can say more about that later, but that's the basic math. Here's the important take home, right? I get these points in this space and I can, re I can understand what the points mean in reference to the connections that they've, been, that they've made. So Nick is on the right because he made these kinds of connections. John is on the left because he made those kinds of connections. In other words, Nick, it turns out, is doing just what we thought the engineers were going to do. Look, here's the pathway, and here's the pathway that we thought was going to be in place. Um, so let me quickly talk about the tool that we used to do that. And again, I'm just going to kind of sketch an overview. I'll show you some of the data, and then I'm just going to kind of wrap up. So that's where we're at in the, in the talk here. Um, <clears throat> OK, so the tool is called ENA, Epistemic Network Analysis. So if epistemic frames are a way of uh, modeling the big D discourse that composes a culture, then epistemic network analysis is a way of modeling the epistemic frame that models the discourse that explains the culture. OK, that's, that's, a, that's a mouthful, but there you go. Um, so again, uh, we can upload a set of files, and it does, such some nice, it does some nice things, like you can create folders for different projects and blah, blah, blah. Again, we have graduate students who can explain this in more detail. The website also has video walkthroughs, uh, tutorials, sample data, a whole bunch of other good stuff. Uh, again, I can say more about that in questions as well. Um, in order to use this, I have to tell the system in my data what are the actual conversations that are taking place. Who's talking with whom? And what are the relationships? So somebody asked about interview data before, right? Has to know which which lines of data correspond to which interview and which question. So that's the that, you have to give it that information, um, and then you have to tell it what which things you want to model. So do I want to model the network for John and for Nick? Do I want to model the network of their whole group as they have their discussion? I, that, I have to give, give it that information. And then I have to choose where the codes are in the data. Because of course the system doesn't know. I've just given it a data file. Um, there's also a, a guidelines to how to format your data in the, on the website too. Um, then I have to tell it how long I want those, the window of the stanza to be. Right. So if people are only making contributions every few minutes, the stanza window is probably pretty narrow. If they're talking like this, then the stanza window gets wider. Right? Um, OK, so pretend I've chosen all that on John and Nick's data right, and run the model. Here's what, an act, here's what actual data from the actual game looks like. Um, this is one network. And this is actually an, a mean network, an averaged network. Um, it's average network across a whole bunch of more advanced students who are using the simulation, using the game. Um, and if I zoom in, that's the centroids. The square centroid is the centroid of the mean. It's, their, it's sort of the average place that these advanced students are, and that's the network we're looking at. And it's the average of all of these points, which are the individual networks of the individual students. So now I've gone from a whole set of networks for individual students, and I'm able to visualize what these people look like kind of on average. Um, <clears throat> and I can compare that to a set of novices. And this is actually, this is called the subtra uh, subtraction network graph. So the places that are red were stronger among the novices, and the places that were in blue were stronger among the experts. Right? And if you'll notice that that pathway that we were talking about earlier, right, that we hypothesized knowing what we know about engineering and looking at the data, this was going to be a significant thing that engineers do. Lo and behold, that's what the experts do. Right? But now, having seen that, right, now I can compare a whole bunch of individuals, experts and novices, and I can sort of see where they lie. And what this tells me is, even though we didn't know it, 
Nick is in fact an expert, relative expert, and John isn't in engineering. I have no idea whether that's true, obviously, but you know, a pretend example, I now actually have a quantitative measure, the x dimension of this graph, of sort of the level of expertness, and I can characterize how, I can characterize how that looks. Um, and I can interpret it in terms of this design space, right? So the experts on this side are making connections that involve things like performance metrics, design tools, and performance requirements. And, and the novices, people like John, are thinking a lot about collaboration. And by the way, if you go back and look at the data, which I'll say more about in a moment, like, it's not surprising. The novices haven't solved an engineering problem as a team before. What's the first thing they have to figure out? Who's going to do what? Like, what do we actually do? They have to figure out, like, what are they supposed to do? Who's going to do it? Once you've had some experience, then you can dive right into the more engineering parts of the engineering problem. Um, because this is represented now in a metric space, we can do things like perform a t-test. Right? So we can see whether or not the difference between these groups is significant, which as you can see it is. Um, we have goodness of fit measures, so you can see whether or not this is in fact a good model. So sometimes it may be that I've chosen a bunch of codes, but it doesn't actually make much sense for the data, so you can measure that. Um, and you can also download the network data so that if you wanted to do something more sophisticated than the t-test, you can. In other words, you get all of this. You can think of each person now has a set of information, which is their location in this uh, epistemic network space. And you could do more sophisticated analyses, uh, regressions, clustering, those kinds of things. Um, in other words, if encoder is taking this pathway, right, from field notes to code to the big C code, what ENA is doing is this pathway. It's looking at whether or not the connection, the relationships among the big C codes, among the, the way that people make meaning, can in fact be reflected in the small C codes that I've created and the relations among them. And when it does that, it provides a statistical test. In other words, ENA is also providing a warrant for theoretical saturation. Now it's theoretical saturation for the story that I'm telling about the relationship between these things. So I started out by, by telling you a story that said, well, engineers probably need to make this, to connect this pathway. And I showed you one example of a piece of that pathway. I, if, it was a good, if I was a good ethnographer and had more time, I obviously would tell you, give you a more extended example. But I gave you one example. And then what I'm able to show using ENA is that that pattern of connections actually is a recurrent thing in the data. It happens over and over again. I don't need to keep showing you other examples to, convince, to, to make the case that that example was enough. Now, there may be other patterns that are interesting, and I could explore those as well, but at least for this one, um, that turned out to be interesting. Now, there's some reasons why you might want to do this. Uh, everybody's familiar with the fact that if you have students working online, I know that's a, that, that's, we're in a digital education group, so there's a lot of things that, you know, working with digital tools, you get all sorts of information. But one of the things that you can get using a technique like this is a model of how the discourse is unfolded over time. So here, this is actually in one of our games. This is a view that the teacher can see. And you can see the chat, the actual things that the students are talking about on the right. And in the middle, we see their evolving network model. And it turns out that we, the teachers we've talked to, this is exactly what they want to know. How are the students talking? Are they making the connections that we care about? And as the chat unfolds, you can see as they pick up key ideas and then make key connections among them. And because the system now knows what connections they've made and have not made, it can make suggestions either to the students or to the teachers. It could say, look, here's a student, and here's something that you could say to them if you want to praise them, if you want to help them, and, and so on. Um, so, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> so I just want to highlight one um, kind of uh, final and really important feature here. So I'm sure there are some of you who are thinking, wait, we have all this rich data, and we've reduced it to this set of points in space. That doesn't seem very ethnographic. And, I would, and to that I would I, I say, well, OK, but each of those points is, in fact, this network. And you can see the connections that somebody's making. And somebody might say, well, OK, that's a little closer to the data, but it still seems very far away. Well, in ENA, I can actually click on one of these lines. And what that will do is bring up the original data and show me where in the data the codes occurred that made this connection and show me the specific windows, the stanzas, where that connection occurred. And now I can go back and I can read it and I can go all the way back to the ground. I can say, okay, I have this high level model 
and I can see how those things are connected, but where in the data is that actually warranted? And now I can see it specifically, and if I want to start making a more typical ethnographic argument, I see exactly the places where the examples are that I would need to draw on in order to both validate in qualitative terms what I'm doing, but also to make the argument and, and provide the explanation that I, that I want to provide. In other words, the statistics here <coughs> aren't, aren't just doing this. They are also tied back to the original thick description that I want to be, kind of thick description that I want to be making. And this is really important. Because as many of you probably know, in a lot of um, statistical techniques for looking at discourse data, so big data in education, right, does instead what I would call thin description, meaning there isn't this tie back into the ground. It's just statistical analyses. Um, now, I know that probably all of our uh, parents said at one point, if you don't have anything nice to say, so I'm not going like, to give you a bunch of citations and stuff, but I want to give you uh, one quick example. Okay, of the kind of thing that we sometimes see that this is that quantitative ethnography is very deliberately not doing. Right, so um, some of you are probably familiar with Co with Cohen's D. It's a measure of effect size. It basically tells you when you find a statistical result how how big is the difference. So uh, just to give you like an example, um, collaborative working in collaborative groups has an effect size of about 0.3, which means that um, if I have a group of students who are not working collaboratively and a group of students who are working collaboratively. The group of students who are working collaboratively are going to go up like a third of a standard deviation on their outcome measure. Okay? So that's just a way of getting a sense of how big an effect is. And typically, an effect of 0.2 is small, 0.5 is big, 0.8 is huge. In education, if you see anything over 0.2, you're going to go, wow, that's a big difference. Because essentially, a standardized test score, one year of schooling is about a 0.5 standard, uh, Cohen's D. So something that's got an effect size of 0.2 is like the equivalent of half a year of instruction. So that's a big deal, right? Okay, so this is, I'm gonna refer to a study that shall remain nameless because I don't wanna impugn it. It's nobody here. Um, <laughs> I don't wanna impugn anybody, but so here's a study. They had 21 million data points of students working in a, in a uh, it was a, game, a math game, right? And they recorded 54, 540,000 moves and they did some statistical tests that had P of less than 0.001. Now for stats people, like P less than 0.001, wow, that's really good. Except that if you have 21 million data points, a P less than 0.001 means that just at chance, you're gonna find 540 significant results at the level of P less than one. Worse than that, the results that you find are gonna have a Cohen's D of less than 0.001, which means it's gonna explain 0.0000025% of differences in the standard. Right. So that's the equivalent, I didn't do the math here, I should have, that's the equivalent of like th three minutes of instruction, <laughs> right? Which is fine, okay, three minutes of instruction, add enough, enough, three minutes of instructions, and I guess it makes it, but you have to add a lot of three minutes of instruction to make a difference. It's probably actually less than three minutes. So if 0.2 is a half a year, that's 5% uh, of a year, right? So 5% of a year is like, what, a week? So this is a tenth of a week, is like a half a day. Anyway, you can get the idea. This is really small. Um, and worse, the conclusions you get are things like this. And I, I swear, I took this quote from a paper, okay? This is looking at the PISA data. Those students who are socially and economically less advantaged have high anxiety towards mathematics and low self-concept in mathematics, but still clearly above average attitude towards school are girls who perform below level three. Okay, now forgetting about the fact that that is really poorly written, like what would you, what could you possibly do with that piece of information? It is statistically significant. It's a pattern that they found, but it has, there's, it's not connected to the ground in any way. And that's what quantitative ethnography is trying to do. It's trying to use these statistics to reconnect things to ground. This is just an example of, of uh, what we call in computer science, Geigo, right? Garbage in, garbage out. If I just throw a bunch of stuff at the wall and see what sticks, what I wind up with is a bunch of stuff stuck on my wall, but it doesn't necessarily make a painting, unless I'm, uh, you know, uh, Jasper Johns. Anyway, um, <laughs> so the idea of quantitative ethnography is to, is to retain the thick description, to build off of that thick description, and use statistical tools to warrant the theoretical saturation of those thick descriptions. Methodologically, this is borrowing from yeah, an idea of Clifford, by, of Clifford, from Clifford Geertz, who those of you who do qualitative research I'm sure are familiar with, um, where he says the essential task of ethnography is not to codify extract regularities, but to make thick descrip description possible. Not to generalize across cases, but to generalize within them. And what uh, 
quantitative ethnography is doing is using statistical tools to provide a warrant for the generalization within the quantita qualitative case that, that's being made. Uh, there's uh, more detail on this specific idea in a paper from 2004 called What Good Are Statistics That Don't Generalize, which is a, an a American uh, ed researcher. So it's uh, sort of written for a general audience, not heavy on the statistics. Um, there's also a book that will be coming out, I hope by the first of the year, called Quantitative Ethnography. Um, I don't know the author, but uh, I've heard good things about it. Um, and, uh, but in general, right, quantitative ethnography is the science of using statistical methods to warrant claims about theoretical saturation in qualitative data. I'm about to wrap up, but I do want to give thanks to a bunch of people who have worked on this, and actually uh, Dragon's name should be on here as well. I was editing the slides quickly. Um, uh, Dragon and Shreko have done uh, uh, some great work helping us think through issues in quantitative ethnography and ENA and how it connects to other sorts of measures of uh, learning and data. Um, and of course, our support from the National Science Foundation and we hope soon from the British uh, Education and Research Council. Um, so let me stop there. Uh, the tools I've talked about are ENA, uh, row R or ROAR, encoder, of course, the concept of row. Um, there's a couple of websites that you might check out. Epistemicnetwork.org is a very well developed website, although ugly, because uh, we focus on content, not on flash. Uh, but uh, it has uh, videos and walkthroughs and uh, links to all the papers, um, guides for setting up data, user guides, uh, links to the tool, and so forth. The encoder website is a little less well developed. Encoder is a newer tool, and we are uh, it's a little buggy, so use it your use at your own risk, but um, uh, it can be very useful. And as I say, we ha if you write me, um, and my email address is easy to find, or just epistemicgames plus ENA at gmail.com, uh, there are students whose job it is to help people learn to use these tools if they're interested. So I don't have anything that tells me what time it is, but um, let me stop there. Uh, we have some time left. I'm happy to take questions and if people don't have questions that they want to ask in the general group, I'm happy to uh, talk to people individually at the end as well and communicate on email and so forth. Anyway, thank you very much. I appreciate having a chance to talk to you. David, thanks so much for the excellent talk. And I think it's been quite really enlightening for many aspects so, of it. So we are now open for some questions. So please, don't hesitate to ask some really hard questions. Yeah, especially those of you who do a lot of qualitative work. I'm, I'm, yes, I'm, I'm, yes. Happy, I'm happy to talk through either what this really looks like or whether or not it's really valid to begin with. Any questions, comments, or just even ideas from folks? Yes, yeah. please. Uh, maybe it's not about the method, it's more about the personal experience. So I find uh, you um, studied media-related subject for a PhD and MSc. How did you transfer from media study to this kind of um, quantitative uh, uh, ethnography? Sure. Area? Yeah. yeah. Um, <coughs> Uh, so the so uh, I'm, I'm guessing your question is about so my degree was from MIT and at the Media Lab, which is known for being kind of like the wild west of academia. Well, anything goes as long as you can make it flashy. Um, so how did I get from that to doing something as kind of grubby as thinking about the the messy problem of of analyzing qualitative data statistically? Uh, and the short answer to that is, um, but even even from the start in my dissertation, um, I, I was interested in, the, in questions that could be answered by qualitative data. Um, but because I was working in domains that were computer supported in some way, I had a lot, I had a lot of data that I was therefore not really, being, not really able to do much with. Um, and so one of the things that I, that I tried to do even early on is to, to say, well, I'm, I can look at the data and see these interesting patterns, but now I have all this other data. Is there some way I can, I can see whether the pattern that I saw in the thing that I can zoom into in some way reoccurs? And that was really the sort of the, the start of the connection between them. Um, it was, I mean, this was in the 1990s, so we didn't have big data, but we had, you know, well, what is it? We, had, we didn't have venti data, we had, you know, grandi data. Um, so when I, when I went for, to, for the, when the, as the data set that you have expands, um, it, it sort of felt like I didn't want to throw, not throw away, but I didn't want to uh, 
not take advantage of the, of the additional data. So that started me thinking about what kinds of qualitative tools that I could use coming out of the, a grounded approach to the data. Um, and then as I started to think about it more, the, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of discussion about how there are you know, quantitative and qualitative. There are these two worlds that don't meet. It's like the C.P. Snow argument, the arts and the sciences, the humanities and the sciences. Um, and uh, I became interested in the fact that there's this strange divide. And is there some way to start to bring these two discourses, in the literal sense of the term, into conversation? So that, that's kind of, that was sort of the path. Uh, yeah, uh, you, uh, in two, one, two in the back, I'll start on, start on my left and then go to my right. I was just wondering about the e and e within the relationship between the goals. And I was wondering how, how you would handle situations where certain humans, because of the style that they speak in, might appear to speak kind of out of turn or in non sequiturs, but they might actually be making connections that refer back to other points. Yep. That might be quite hard to pick out from the data. Um, well, yes, so yes and no. Um, I mean, it's a really good question. Um, and uh, uh, for, for those of you who I, I had a little trouble hearing, so I'm just going to repeat it as best I can and also make sure that I understand it. Um, so what do you do if, if the register in which students are speaking, the way that they're talking, um, seems like it might be a non sequitur, but in fact they're making connections? Right? How, do, how do you handle that within a scheme like this? Um, so the... E e &A, it's the, well, one thing to think about is that ENA itself is, uh, picks up, so if you, if you think about this diagram, right, um, ENA picks up after the place where you've made a claim that the thing you're seeing in the data means the thing that you think it means. So your question is, is, is handled at the level of the bottom red arrow there, right? So is the student really saying this, um, even if they're speaking elliptically or in an unusual way? That's a question of the assertion that the thing that they said does or doesn't mean the thing that we think it means. ENA is, picks up after that and says, let's assume those assertions are correct. Now what's the relationship? What, what are the relationships, uh, relationships among them? Um, there is a, there's another side to that question, though, which is, um, how do you, what, what's the warrant that things are related to one another? So the, the data that I showed you and the way that ENA typically works, the warrant is temporal proximity. So, and there's some good psychological evidence, right, that says that <coughs> if in discourse, in human discourse, two things that are temporally proximate have a relationship to one another because we act coherently in the world. There could be situations where that's not warranted, in which case, you would essentially have to use that you would use some extra coding in order to account for that phenomenon, and we could talk more about what the math might be, and it depends exactly what the problem is. But yes, there is an assumption in ENA that um, <coughs> that uh, co-occurrence is con is conception, uh, con sorry, is connection. So think about it this way: there, where the assumption is that there's an ep that that John and Nick have an epistemic frame in you know, that that they. They're on, they're the way in which they understand the culture that they're enacting. Yeah. Right? And that epistemic frame gets expressed in their discourse. Yeah. And then if we model what their discourse looks like, we get an understanding of what their understanding of the culture is. Yeah. Right? And so if, there's some, if, if that set of assumptions doesn't hold for Nick for some reason, because, you know, it's Nick, yeah. um, right? uh, then, then we have to think about some other way to address that. Um, but in terms of, like, you know, kids who are from different socioeconomic background and use different vocabulary, you would handle that in the, at, the, at the phase of encoder where you were thinking about how to determine whether this counts as... as so I mean, an easy example would be if a student uses very colloquial vocabulary but is talking about design trade-offs, how, how do you count that? And that's at the level of coding. Yeah, that's actually, not, so I hadn't thought about it that way, and that's also a good question. Um, so uh, it would probably depend on the specifics of the situation, as, as everything does. As I, when I teach qualitative methods, the first thing I teach students is that the answer to any question is going to be it depends. Um, so it depends a little bit on, on what's exactly happening. But um, one thing you could do is use a, just for different students, use a different size window. 
so you could actually allow it. And the you have to we have to specially you have to run that analysis a little differently than the standard one. But that would certainly work for that for, for something like that if that's the problem. Okay. Uh, you want to ask about interviews? Yeah. <laughs> So let me, let me first answer a question that you didn't ask, which is like, how would you even do interviews? Because it's probably a worthwhile thing to say. So uh, the question for, for how you would take an interview and do this is just a question of how, what's, what constitutes a stanza. So over what span in the, in the discourse, in the, in the answer, do I count somebody as making a connection? So you, is, if I ask a question in a semi-structured interview, is everything that somebody says after that all related? Uh, it depends on who you're talking with. But uh, you know, as the answer gets longer, you might believe that something that somebody said at the end might or might not be connected with what they said at the beginning. So that's just a, that's a question, again, it comes out of the grounded, and like, you have to, the tool doesn't know. You have to say what you think the structure of relationships is. Once you define that, then ENA works just fine. You're looking at the structure of, the, of their answers over time. Uh, the specific question you were asking, um, was, was, well, what happens if I'm the only person who's coding? What does validity mean in that case? So first, let me just say that ethnography does not require integrated reliability, right? Um, Margaret Mead did not do integrated reliability on her, on her studies. Clifford Geertz in the, uh, the Balinese cockfight, notes on the Balinese cockfight, for those of you who know. For those of you who don't know it, go Google it, read it right now. It's fantastic. But, um, <laughs> Right. He didn't do integrated reliability when he was in the village in Bali observing cockfights. He took notes and he uh, uh, um, created an account of it, and it's brilliant. Right? So uh, you can do good work without constructing integrated reliability. You're just saying that uh, even more so, so any story that you tell about data that you have is about the interaction between you and the data. right? There, one, of the, one of the ground rules of ethnography is that there is not an objective truth that you're reporting on. There's a subjective interaction between you as the investigator and the, and the data. So all that the, um, quantitative ethnography is doing is trying to provide some additional warrants around the generalizability uh, or, the, um, uh, or other features of what it is you're talking about. It's not required. That having been said, uh, if you have agreement with an automated coding process, that suggests that there's a certain consistency to the way that you've coded the data that you wouldn't have otherwise, right? If you were just if you just said I went through and I coded it, and that's that and that was done, you might not even know. So when I code, like one of the things that's most annoying when I've coded by hand is when I'm done coding, I realize that actually the stuff I did at the beginning isn't quite right because I changed my mind about I like I learned as I was coding, and then I have to go back and I have to do it again, and then by the time I get through the second, I'm like wait. I have to do it again. So, so uh, the, what using a tool like Encoder does is, is assures that there's a certain consistency across your coding. Um, in the quantitative ethnography book, in fact, one of the things I write about, nobody ever does this as far as I know. But if you really were being consistent as a single person coding data, you would want to take a random sample of your codes from one point of your coding and a random sample from another point and compare and make sure that they, the, uh, you would go back and recode some and make sure that you were in fact being consistent. Nobody ever does that. The, the point is that, that uh, ethnography, qualitative methods, does not require any of this. These are just additional things that you can do that provide additional warrants about the claims that you're trying to make. Is that helpful? Yeah. Yeah, first great talk. Thank you very much. And um, what about the projections or the goals <coughs> that you currently have with this uh, quantitative data? For example, is is an interest to evaluate uh, students' learning from novice to experts in the future? Uh, so we we already do some of that. Um, you know, uh, so I, I have a few different goals. One of them is to look at the 
technologies and approaches that we build for learning and to understand them better. A second is to be able to, to make claims that they are effective. So understanding something and claiming it's effective are not necessarily, they're related, but they're not the same thing. The first I do because I think it actually matters and makes the world better. The second I do because it makes it possible to get funding, right? So those are two important uh, different things. Um, and then there's a third thing, which is uh, I actually care about the methods themselves. Um, as a scientist, I'm interested in how people think about the world scientifically. And so I'm interested in making the method available to other people. And every time that somebody uses it, uh, we, we collectively, collaboratively, learn something about the method. So I'm, what's your name? Uh, uh, yeah. And Nicola. Anna? Nicola. Oh, Nicola. So Nicola's question was something that I had actually never thought about before. Um, and so even just through hearing that question, it gives me another way of thinking about uh, what some of the processes that we might use in, uh, in ENA might look like. And I, I hope it gives Nicola something to think about in terms of the work that she's doing. So uh, the, the sort of three different goals. Um, and in the third goal, that is sort of understanding the method, my hope is that it also becomes useful for people to accomplish the first two goals, understanding what the interventions and things that they're doing, and looking at efficacy for the work that they do. Yeah. Thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I have a question about the, the encoder. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that um, to run the system, we have to define the big, big cones, big C, yeah. small Cs, which is some have some features that we identify in this uh, bigger phenomenon mm -hmm. that we decide to to code with. Yeah. And does that mean that we so the way we code will then be um, framed under this um, um, this is rule because mm -hmm. we know that when we are coding uh, people's conversations, sometimes it's not um, the cause that we decide to use, the top or say the theme, it's not the reflected in the exact wordings, even if we assign small c's, yep. the small c's may not exactly get reflected in what this person say, while it actually it still falls in the same category of yep. the big c or the same small c. Yep. And, and which would Well, so absolutely, you, whatever, however you implement a code always has to be, so implement, and by implementing a code, so implementing code literally means going from the big C code to the little C code. Um, sure, we always have to be sensitive to what the discourse actually looks like. Um, but if I could step back from your, so that's a great question. Let me step back from it for a second, though, because I, I want to be clear about the, what the big C and little C codes are doing. They're doing exactly the same thing that anybody does when they code qualitative data. So when you identify a theme, that's a big C code, and I'm happy to call it a theme. I, we just call it a bit, I mean, you have to call it something, so we'll call it, let's call it a theme for now. Right? Anytime you have a theme and you code data, at least in theory, you're looking at your data, which usually is on paper, doesn't mean you could do video coding too, but let's pretend we're working with a transcript. And you're gonna say, I see the theme here and you point at some piece of the data. And it may, it may be a lot of the data, it may be something very convoluted, there may be a lot of interpretation that you do, and ex an explanation. You may point at a piece here and a piece here and say, well, this means this because of what was said before. But all of those, that, that whole operation of pointing at the data is a small C code. So a way of thinking, my way of thinking about your question is, what happens if you have a very complex small C code? What if your small C code is not just identifying a few keywords? What if your small C code involves understanding something that was said a few minutes ago, understanding something about the student, understanding something about the whole corpus of data? As, these, as your small C codes get complicated, isn't it hard to use a tool like Encoder? Is that, is that a fair retranslation of what you're saying? Um, yes, and also that the way to use the small C code, it, it's not 
is it um, are these small sequels extracted from the words that my participants use? Uh, so they're going to be combination of topic modeling here. Yeah. So the so there'll be so. So again, a small C code is just whatever rule you use to go from the bit from the data to the theme. That's what the small C code is. So whatever whatever process you use, it's your small C code. Some of those processes are easy to implement in Encoder. So if your process is, I look for. So if somebody's talking about design trade-offs, I mean balance trade-off. Like there's a few key words. It turns out, for example, we code for justifications all the time. Like, is somebody explaining what they're doing? There's like 15 words in English that you can look for. Because, so, therefore, like, and that's enough. Like, you get, we get really high kappas, statistically significant high kappas from that. Um, some codes, some small C codes, are harder to, to do in an encoder. Um, they're more complicated than expressions that people use. There's a wide variety of expressions that people use. They use very idiosyncratic expressions, uh, as Nicola was, was suggesting. Um, so some small C codes are harder to do in encoder. Some are probably actually impossible. Um, something that I didn't mention in, a, in this talk because it's short is that there are actually two different kinds of small C codes. So one is called a primary code, and the second is called a derived code. So a primary code means that I can see something right there in the data. I can point at it and say, yep, I see this, and that's an example of this theme. A derived code is a code that requires one or more primary codes. So, for example, if I'm talking about a justification, I'm justifying my decision based on data, which is something that engineers are supposed to do. The way we actually look for that is we look for a code for justifying, this, uh, the big C code of justifying, and we look for a big C code of talking about data. And when we see both of those codes together, then we assert that somebody is justifying something based on data. So that's the way you would handle something like, in order to understand what somebody said right here, I have to see something that they said earlier. That would be a, deri a, a derived code. So something, oh, another way of thinking is that some small C codes, some ways of operationalizing a theme, of coding for a theme, are really easy to do in encoder. Some of them require a more complex combination of codes, of, of identifications in the data. And some might be so complex that, we, that you can't do them that way. And that's OK. Uh, that, that will happen sometimes. Is that a helpful? I think. Um, the book actually talks more about this. And I'm happy to talk more about it. Or you can talk more about it with the, if you're interested in trying Encoder, the students who work with it know all about those kinds of distinctions. Any other questions? One else, please. Yeah, please. Uh, the games that you are using there uh, in the US, uh, you are using them just as a research tool, or there is a, another objective? Yeah, so that's a whole other sales pitch. Um, so the, the, yeah, they, we call the games virtual internships. Um, and we call them that because if you give teenagers an educational game and nothing blows up in the first five minutes, they think it's boring and not a game. Um, so we call them virtual internships, and it turns out that then the students know exactly what to expect, and the teacher knows exactly what to expect, and the parents know exactly what to expect, and everybody's happy. So these virtual internships, which are in fact role-playing games, but the, so instead of like Dungeons and Dragons, it's contracts and, and clients or something like that. But in any case, uh, so there's these role-playing games. Um, we have three of them that we've developed, um, including uh, the two engineering games that we've talked about, Nefertex and Rescue Shell. There's also a game called Land Science, which is about urban planning. So students redesign their city or redesign a city in order to understand something about social and economic, uh, social economic and environmental uh, issues and how they interact in uh, human land use. Um, then we've also developed an authoring tool. So that virtual internships are actually set in a platform called WorkPro, which is so think about like um, Microsoft Office 365, except custom designed so that you can have virtual, you can interact with virtual coworkers instead of just your uh, real people. Um, and uh, that's a whole other talk about how that works. But So that platform is what hosts the internships. And then we have an authoring tool, virtual internship authoring tool, VIA, um, which lets teachers customize the internships, which actually turns out is really important. Again, a, a whole other discussion. I'll say more about that in just a second. But, um, or just author their own. So we've had people who have authored versions of the land use game for other cities. 
Um, somebody developed a teacher training uh, exercise. Um, that was somebody in Holland, actually. Uh, we have colleagues in Denmark who are adapting the games for uh, in Danish. Um, we have uh, somebody developed a political media consulting simulation um, using the uh, virtual internship tool. So it's partly research for us. It's partly a tool that's available to other researchers and developers. It's partly something that teachers use in their classroom with kids. I, I forget how many thousand it is, but we've had uh, many thousand students have, have used them uh, to date. So that's kind of a whole other suite of work that I'm, I'm it was the foundation for this method, methodology talk. There is a whole other talk about the, uh, and discussion of that. that. Um, the, if you're interested, that's, uh, if you look up virtualinterns.org, there's information about the tool and so forth. And if some of you are interested in using that, we, I'd be delighted to have that conversation with you as well. Uh, the quick thing I'll say that's just interesting about that, because it's kind of in been interesting to me lately, uh, so if, if you look at the way teachers use um, mat curricular materials, like the typical, if it's not a syllabus because it's K-12, but the typical like lesson plan has students, you know, read page 37 to 48 and 52 to 56 and do problems 1 through 7 odd and 27 through 36 even, right, in your textbook. They do this kind of mixing and remixing of curricular material in order to customize textbooks and other things for their students. The challenge is, for those of you who work, and I guess that's everybody in here, right? Working in immersive digital environments is as the environment gets very immersive, as the world, the fictional world that's created gets very complicated, it's hard for a teacher to do that. They can talk outside of the game or the simulation or the environment and contextualize it for students, but it's hard to change the environment itself in a way that doesn't break the story, doesn't break the narrative, doesn't break the diegesis of the underlying environment. Um, and what that means is that these immersive environments are really powerful, but they're brittle from a teacher's point of view. I kind of either do it or I don't. Um, and so the, what we've seen with the authorware tool is that a teacher's ability to customize something makes a big difference in terms of how they envision it in their classroom and how they are, whether they're willing to adopt it and how they adopt it. Um, and we've seen our use really go way up because when a teacher says, oh, you know, that, the, the instructions are just a little too complicated, we say, fine, just change them. And they, you know, then they can change it. And of course, the trick is how to let them make changes that doesn't break the pedagogical dependencies of the environment, right? So I want to I remove one of the questions from, the, uh, from that task. Well, if I remove the question, I have to remove the rubric that the system uses. I have to remove the feedback that the system uses. I have to remove the question from the example that the system provides. And God forbid I add one, then I have to make sure to add a rubric and an example and the feedback that goes with the rubric of oh, three forms because there's good, bad, and integrated. So the authoring tool has to help a teacher track all of those things, which is what, the, which is what it does. That's why it's been an interesting project. But, it's, but just from a kind of forgetting about the methodology hat for a second, from the a digital tools hat, there's a really interesting question there around the plasticity of digital media, uh, digital educational media, um, and how important that is. Yeah, sorry, I, that was much more than you probably wanted to know. Short answer is yes. Teachers and students use these, and we're happy to have people use them too. Thank you. All right. Well, okay. let's thank David one more. Well, super. Thank you. Please do feel free to follow up in, on, on any of these topics, either while I'm here or, or after. Yeah, and thanks everybody for coming. This is this was a seminar in, this, in the digital education series. You can check out our website, D. Uh, ED AC UK, and then basically you can also see some other new seminars that will be happening in the next uh, weeks, uh, uh, and there are many other exciting talks that are coming up. So thanks for everyone. My guess is you want this. I'll do that before anybody asks any questions. So you have to wait. <laughs> yeah.